There we go. It says we're live. Good evening. Welcome back to Anchor Church. I say welcome back because most of the people in the room were here this morning, and I'm glad that they're here. If you are online watching tonight, welcome. I'm glad that you are here, and uh, I'm excited to continue our series on questions. And uh, I've already been told by the folks in the room they want to see if I can outdo myself from this morning, but if you did not see this morning's message, I, I nearly preached myself to death today, or I guess... Everybody demanded my preaching this morning. <laughs> I felt very supported, very loved today. And so, um, as preachers say amongst ourselves, y'all preached me to death this morning, <laughs> pulling it out of me. But we had a good service, and that's been posted recently online. So if you have an opportunity to see that, I don't very often try to steer people toward other messages unless it's part of a series. But this morning we had a particularly great time um, here in the sanctuary. And uh, if you're able to go back and look at that message uh, I would encourage you to do so. It was it was quite uh, quite good, if I say so, myself, and if the responses of the people that are here, any indication, um, and if the way the Lord showed up was any indication, we had a tremendous worship service and prayer time before we even started preaching today. It was just good all around, so I spent a minute talking about that. Let's talk about why you're here tonight. Tonight, we're talking about questions, part 10. We're on the 10th part of this question series. If you want to give this a, a title this evening? Uh, part 10 is entitled, On Whose Terms? On Whose Terms? The scripture we're going to begin with tonight, and there is a lot of scripture tonight, but where we're going to start is with 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to be reading verses 2 through 10. 1 Samuel <laughs> chapter 17, verses 2 through 10. And this is questions part 10, On Whose Terms? While you're looking for that, let's go ahead and pray so once we get started, we don't have to stop tonight. Father, I thank you this evening for the opportunity that we've got to gather again. I thank you for your presence in this morning's service. I thank you that you have been faithful to show up over and over again through the course of this series. It's the longest I've ever, ever taught, Father, and you continue to show me things about the questions that are asked and presented in the Bible. And I thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to teach and show us things that we need to know about you and about ourselves through the lens of the questions that are asked in Scripture. I pray tonight that you'll be with me and that I'll preach well. I pray that your purpose is accomplished here in this house and in the hearts and the minds and the homes of the people that are listening who are not actually here in the building with us. Open their hearts and their, their spirits and their ears to receive what you would have for them, Lord. Let there be nothing that stands between your word and them tonight so that your purpose is accomplished. Let me deliver it well, and God have your way tonight in this service. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Hope you've had time to find 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start reading in verse 2 right now. Saul and the men of Israel had gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. Now just con context here in case you don't have a headliner in your Bible that tells you where we are. This is the David and Goliath story. You've more than likely heard it. We're not going to talk so much about that actual battle tonight, but we need to set the stage with this portion of the Scripture. So Israel... And the Philistines are lining up on opposite sides of the valley. In verse 3, it says, The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall. He wore a bronze helmet and a bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins, and a bronze sword was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield-bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations. Why do you come out to line up in battle formation, he asked them. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. The Philistine then said, I defy the rank of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. Let's pray one more time over the reading of God's word. Father, I thank you for your word and for the reading of it. I pray that your purpose will be accomplished because we've gathered to hear it tonight. Let it do its work and not return void and be honored by our gathering here in your name. Amen. I want to say this to you tonight. Before we even address the question too quickly that was, uh, was presented here, we're going to get to that, but I want to say this. Your victory or your defeat 
depends entirely upon whose terms you are fighting. I told you tonight's message is on whose terms. Your victory or your defeat in whatever you're facing in your life, spiritually or naturally right now, is determined entirely upon whose terms you are fighting on. There is no battle that has ever been fought and no battle that ever will be fought in which God is not already the victor. God has won even before the battle takes place. He doesn't lose. He doesn't fail. He doesn't give up. He never runs out on you. Wrote a song about it. Want to hear it? No, we're not doing that tonight. <laughs> God has already won every battle that there ever was. And he has already won every battle that ever there will be. The question is, are you fighting on his terms or on the terms of your enemy? Because you will not find yourself successful and you will not find yourself winning in the battle against your adversary if you're fighting on the enemy's terms. Second Chronicles 20 and 15 reads this way. Listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number, for the battle is not yours but God's. All battles are God's. I want you to get that through your head. We're going to get to the question part of this in a minute, but you need to understand when a battle presents itself before you, the battle is the Lord's. And you'll remember we taught not too long ago about Joshua encountering the commander of the Lord's army in the desert. And the question that Joshua asked was, whose side are you on? And the commander of the Lord's army says, I'm not for you or against you. Are you on my side or not? Are you on the side of the Lord or are you on someone else's? The battle is always God's. Whose side are you on and whose terms are you using to engage in battle? The question we see tonight is upon whose terms are you fighting? Goliath, in verse 8 of this account we've just read, challenges two things. The first thing he challenges are the tactics of Israel. He asks the question, why do you line up in a battle formation? The question Goliath is asking is meant to undermine them. You have come to fight a certain kind of battle. I can see from the way that you've lined up that you have a certain kind of war and a certain kind of victory in mind. But it seems to me from where I'm standing, says Goliath, that you've come to the wrong battle because you don't seem to be approaching it in the way that I intend to fight. Why do you seem prepared, Israel, to fight a battle that's different than the one I called you here for? Goliath attempts first to challenge the tactics of Israel. He asks this question because he's establishing his dominance and saying, I'm in control of what happens on this battlefield today. Don't know what you came here for, but I got something else in mind, and you have already misstepped before you've even thrown a spear or knocked an arrow into the first bow. Goliath challenges the tactics of Israel. This concept, this approach to a battle, is the same one that Satan used in the desert with Jesus. We would have looked at Jesus and it says he was led into the desert to be tempted and we would have expected that temptation to be something along the lines of wouldn't it be easier not to do what God's asked you to do? How about if you just curse God, Jesus? Why don't you do that? Come rebel and have fun. Let's get on this highway to hell together. Let's do something that seems more enjoyable than going to the cross to die. How about that, Lord? That kind of assault is something that we would have expected, and Satan seeks to just redefine the terms right off the bat. And he says, not, why did you come here? Why don't you do something different? He says, Jesus, you look hungry. You look thirsty. It's hot out here, and you're probably tired. The undertone of that whole situation is you came here for a certain kind of fight, but I got something else in mind. Let's talk about this instead. Can we look at this from a different perspective? The, sa the same tactic was used by Goliath that was used by Satan. He sought to change the rules of engagement and sought to change the terms of the battle. 
Satan, always, always, always. Your enemy without fail, his first assault on you is not going to be to try and run you down and beat you up and destroy you and hurt you. The first thing he wants to do is get you to engage him and make the first move and do it on his terms. What he wants to do is lure you out of the place that God put you and seek to have you use a weapon other than the one God gave you and attack him in the way that he is more comfortable with. It's that home court advantage idea. You watch a great rivalry in sports and you want to see The team that's visiting upset the home team because you know the home team has an advantage. Satan wants to draw you into his battle plan and his tactic and where he's comfortable. Don't come in. Why are you standing here in a battle formation? I've got something else in mind. Come fight me the way I would prefer. When you strip it down and look at it that way, it seems absolutely absurd. It's borderline just stupid. Why? Would I come and fight you on your terms, on your field, with your weapons, with all your rules? And yet when we're confronted with something in our life, we'll look at things with our logical mind and we'll say, I know the Lord says I should just stand firm, or I know the Lord says that I should get up and pray, or I should get on my knees, or I should wait, or I should, but if I look at the situation, it seems like it needs my attention right now. It seems like I've got some, some gifts and some skills, and it would make a lot more sense for me to run in and just take care of this now before it gets a lot worse. If I wait on the Lord, this person may not get saved. If I wait on the Lord... My child might fall into some worse sin than they're already in. If I take time to pray and try to seek out what's going on with the Lord, what's going to be happening with this situation with my husband or my job? I need to be out there and in it right now. You've already lost because you've allowed Satan to lure you into something by using your natural mind. And he says, come fight me with your natural thoughts and what seems right to you. Don't come at it the way the Lord told you to, because that's a position of strength and he can't deal with it. Goliath comes out and he questions the tactic of Israel in the same way that your enemy comes and questions the tactics of the Lord and will try to talk you out of using them. He's got a motive. There's a reason for that. Satan will look at you and he'll say, you seem to believe that you came to fight a very different battle than what's actually going to happen here today. I came prepared, and I'd like you to engage me with my rules. Because surely with the rules of the Lord you will lose. If you don't improvise and adapt and overcome what I've prepared for you, surely you'll be defeated. My way makes more sense, doesn't it? And if all we're using is our natural mind, if the army of Israel is lined up looking at the army of the Philistines and they say, well, they've got a bigger army and they, they, they've got a lot more advanced weaponry and they've got a better position than we do, it would seem like it makes a whole lot more sense for us to just have one man fight one man. Logically, that makes a whole lot more sense. Even if he's a giant, it, it, yeah, those, those terms seem to make a certain amount of sense. And yet they will lead to certain destruction because this is not the design of the Lord. This is the enemy that seeks by their questions to undermine God's power and lure you into a place where they are more comfortable. One of the enemy's best tactics is to convince you to abandon the approach of the Lord and fight on his terms. And even worse than that, if he can get you not just to fight on his terms, but to fight on your own if he can lead you to believe that you're in control and you can determine how this battle is going to work, you've lost and you've lost even harder and even worse than if you agree to the ones that he gave you. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. This is a letter that Paul wrote and he says, I, Paul, make a personal appeal to you by the gentleness and graciousness of Christ. I am humble among you in person, but I'm bold toward you when I'm absent. I beg you that when I'm present, you'll not that I will not need to be bold with the confidence by which I plan to challenge certain people who think we are behaving in an unspiritual way. Before I even go on from there, Paul is writing to a church that says there are people who are trying to convince you that when you're doing things the way God said so, you're not actually being spiritual. 
They want to convince you that the spiritual thing you're doing is carnal. We live in a world that wants to teach us. Oh, well, what the church is doing is no different than what the world is doing. It looks like the same tactics that people use in business and that they use in war and that they use in philosophy. It's just different names. It's just a different skin on it. You just gave God a different name. There's lots of stories like that. Abandon your approach. You're not being spiritual at all. Paul was encountering this even in the church and felt, need, felt the need to write a letter about it. I'm going to challenge certain people who would say that you're not behaving in a spiritual way. For though we live in a body, we do not wage a war in an unspiritual way, since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. There's a translation of this that I grew up with that says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not earthly. They are not man-made. They do not pertain to me. I want you to see where I'm going. If it is not a carnal, natural, earthly weapon, the weapon that I'm called to use is heavenly and something other than me. If the weapon is godly and heavenly, then we can liken it to the spiritual gifts that we've talked and taught about. They don't belong to me. They belong to the Lord of heaven, and they have to be used in the way that he designed them, not the way that I see fit to use them. I can't just go snatch up the weapons of heaven and head out to fight the battle that I feel like fighting the way that I think is best because the battle is not natural and the weapon is not natural. And therefore, if I take an unnatural thing into an unnatural battlefield and try to do natural things with it, I am doomed to die. There is no hope for me if I run onto Satan's battlefield using God's weapons in man's way. I'll be lucky if I don't lop my own arm off with the sword of the Spirit if I'm not using it the way God would have me use it in the place he sent me to apply that. I'm going to overlap too much with this morning. I've still got that up in me. Y'all need to go watch that message. I'm just saying. We can't snatch up the weapons of heaven and go use them in a natural battle. It's not mine to use in the way I see fit in the place that I think I want to use it. This verse, 2 Chronicles 20, 15, if you look just a little farther ahead in 2 Chronicles, it says, the battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. I told you when we opened tonight that the, the Lord owns the victory in every battle. You don't get to claim it. You don't have a right to it. You have no place in it except to be obedient and serve him when he sends you to one. The moment that we're convinced the battle is ours, we've lost the battle because Satan has convinced us we're in control of something that we have no control over and we've lost. We can't respond to the enemy when he comes and questions our tactics by saying, oh, I know how to handle this. I got this one. I don't care if you fought a spiritual battle that looks just like this ten times in ten different churches against ten different wicked evil spirits that have come up against you. If the Lord has not sent you into this one and handed you the weapon you're supposed to use, you are a fool to rush into it thinking you know how to handle this. There's a couple of ways I want to break that idea down before we even get to the second half of Goliath's question. The first thing I want you to know is this. If we're going to rush into a spiritual battle, one that God has sent us to fight, we need to realize something. God never instructed you to go seek out demons and go to war with them. God did not call you the demon hunter. God did not create you. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. God did not create you to war against the principality of the air. He created you to be in a relationship with him. And he gave you a purpose, and that was to spread the gospel and make disciples. He empowered you to have authority over those things in the air, but only if you encounter them while you're on the mission of your primary purpose, be in a relationship with him and go into the world and spread the gospel. He never said, get off the path and go shake the bushes and find all the demons and kill them. Not once. Find me the verse and show it to me. I'm supposed to be in a relationship with Christ. I'm commissioned to share the gospel, and I'm commissioned to make disciples, and I've only got authority over the things that I encounter along the way of accomplishing that purpose. My authority ends when I step outside of the purpose of Christ. Matthew 10, 1, and then we're going to skip to verse 5 through 8. 
follow with me. Matthew 10. Summoning his 12 disciples, he, we're talking about Jesus, gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. Skip to verse 5. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them these instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations. Don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Listen to where he sent them. Go to the lost sheep of of the house of Israel. And as you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, and drive out demons. You've received free of charge, give free of charge. Miracles and spiritual warfare are not some neat tactic that we're supposed to use to attract people to Christ. Look at the thousands of demons I have slayed, now come worship my God. Find me that. Show it to me. It's not there. The gospel always comes first. Verse 7 says, As you go, announce the kingdom of heaven. Go and preach the gospel and make disciples. I talked about this this morning, but it, it just it, it's all tied together. It's all in the book. It's all the same thing. If you don't have a personal relationship with him, you've got nothing to declare, nothing to preach, nothing to teach, and no ability to disciple anyone. So you need to get in a one-to-one -one relationship with Jesus Christ first. And once you've established that, you don't need to run out thinking I'm some great puffed-up warrior because of all the power that God's endued me with. God said, once you've got that established, the next thing you need to do is accept the commission to share the gospel. Go and declare and announce the kingdom of heaven. Get yourself in order and then declare the gospel. And it says then, as you go, announce the kingdom of heaven and then... Once you have proclaimed and declared and taught and discipled, then heal, raise, cleanse, drive out. Never did God say run and shake the bushes and stir up all the devils and banish them and execute them and make examples of all the demons you can find. We don't fight God's battles on the enemy's terms. We don't leave the path and the purpose. That verse in Psalm says, you lead me. He leads us through the valley. He leads us into the field. He leads us into righteousness for his name's sake. That means there's a path that he's following and that he's ordained for me to walk. If you want to see the New Testament version of it, because you don't like the Psalms version in the Old Testament, we hear Paul talking about Finishing a race and finishing and running the course that is set before us. There's a path from point A to point B that we're required to follow. Never once does it say, go off into the bush somewhere. Go off trailblazing and find something to kill as a trophy. We don't fight God's battles on the enemy's terms. We fight the battles that we encounter along the path to our purpose that God has set before us. The enemy would love for you to seek him out on his own terms. He would love to get you on his turf, and he would love to stir things up in your flesh so that he can taunt you, and he can terrorize you, and he can demoralize you, and he can make fun of you, and he can exploit your human weakness. Because the only place that can happen is if you're not in the will and purpose of God. You become a better target the minute that you answer that call of, hey, why did you line up and do it this way? Come do it my way instead. You're no match for the enemy of the Lord if you meet him apart from the Lord. You want to see an example of this? We can look at Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. It's a story you know, but I want to read it again tonight. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths and work aprons that had touched his skin were being brought to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. Then, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered them and said, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul. But who are you? And the man that had the evil spirit leaped upon them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. I don't know about you. I am 
pretty particular about being closed when I leave the house. Some of y'all may be way more liberal than me, but I don't tend to go to the mailbox in my skivvies and certainly not naked. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody. Not even me. I avoid the mirror when I get out of the shower. I'm not interested. The enemy would love to drag you onto his turf because he would love to humiliate you. And it says that he did exactly that. He didn't just make these men look stupid for trying to invoke the name of the Lord. He then sent them out into the street naked. He uncovered all of the things that they would prefer to see covered. Satan exposed and left out for the public all of the things that the Lord would prefer to have dealt with and kept private. We sometimes rush out with these great plans to do great things for the Lord, and what ends up happening is, the sat is that Satan lures us away from where God wants us and everything that we want to keep hidden, and we would prefer to work out in the privacy of our prayer closet or everything that we would prefer to keep private about our past that the Lord has already covered by the blood. When we step out of that covering... Satan would love to expose every bit of that and make a fool of you. What right does he have to preach the gospel? You remember the way that he was in high school? You remember what happened in his first marriage? You remember where that daughter came from? She wasn't married when that girl was born. What right? What purpose can they possibly serve? There may be some more extreme examples and there be, may be some more mild ones, but what Satan wants to do is get you out of the covering of the Lord and off of the path and using a tactic other than the Lord had in mind so that he can expose and embarrass and torment and terrorize you with things that God has sought to deliver you from if you will stay submitted and on the path that he set before you. In this same passage, we see here God was performing miracles through Paul's hands, but that was being done because God, Paul was walking the course that God had set for him. He was making disciples and declaring the gospel, and these other things were happening just as a, they, 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 were, they were an after effect. They weren't even the goal. Certainly we would love to see that. I've said from this pulpit, I want to see some more people get delivered at this altar. I want to see some more people get healed. If it doesn't happen in the church, I want to see it happening outside the church because our people are doing what God's asked them to do. I want to have a church full of folks here that are so full of the Spirit that people know those folks from Anchor pray. They know the Lord. If you want to get something done, you call them. You have them show up. You hire them at your business. You want them there. It's not because I want the name of the church to be great. It's because I want the name of the Lord to be great because of what God's doing with the people that he's connected to the kingdom through these doors and through these relationships and in this house. God performed miracles through Paul's hands because Paul was doing what God sent him to do. But when some men got the idea that they were going to play demon hunter, they found themselves naked and exposed and wounded and powerless to do anything worthwhile, not just in the kingdom, but even in the smallness of the little town where they lived. <laughs> you remember when he was running around naked and cut up and bloody? Don't ask him to pray for you. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks he's going to do for the Lord. The devil would love to make you a laughing stock. If you've had to wander off the beaten path to find a fight, you're fighting on your own and you're going to lose. Make no mistake, every battle is the Lord's and God wins every battle, but if I'm fighting on any ground other than the battlefield that he's designed for me, if I'm fighting under any terms other than the ones that he sent me there under, if I'm fighting for any reason or for any motivation other than the purpose of the gospel of Christ being spread and God's glory being seen through my actions, then I am powerless and I will lose the fight. I don't tell you this because we need to be afraid of evil. I say this because we shouldn't be too anxious to face it apart from the order of the commander of the army, God himself. God didn't instruct you, oh Lord, help me. Ah, help me say this well. Lord Jesus. God never asked you to hunt down the things that offend you 
and to put a stop to the things that offend your church and your delicate sensibilities. He absolutely said we need to tear down some strongholds. We read a verse that says weapons of the warfare aren't carnal. Tear down strongholds. Bring obedience and honesty back into the world. We read that, what Paul said, and that's absolutely what we're supposed to do. Don't let anything exalt itself against the knowledge of God, but we're only supposed to engage those things when we encounter them upon the mission. God didn't say go when you find yourself offended and try to put a stop to it yourself. The Lord's aware that it's there, and I trust you. He's plenty offended and got a plan to put an end to it. And if he didn't send you to be the one, you best stay out of the way of it. You find those things in the life of someone that you're ministering to or mentoring. If you encounter them in your own life and you're offended and you find that God is offended and hurt by those things that are in your life, by all means, resolve them and continue on your path to sanctification and holiness. Root it out of your life and help those that you're responsible to love on and bring into the discipleship of Christ. Help them overcome those things. Square up against it and tear it down if it's in the natural course of events from where I am to where God's sending me. But God has never once advocated or told people to hunt down what offended them and participate in something like cancel culture for his glory. The whole idea that we would participate in that, in, in that aspect of what's going on in the world right now, it's sick and it's perverted it's deception, it causes division, and none of those words I just said are from the Lord. Every one of those things, perversion, division, deception, come from the pit of hell. It's not my job to hunt down what offends me and kill it. It's my job to proceed toward holiness and sanctification and achieve the purpose of God with my life. God didn't tell you to hunt down devils. The second thing God didn't tell you to do was you get to pick what battles you'd like to fight. God did not give you the option to choose which battle you'd like to fight. There are some, some games that we sometimes play. I'll, I'll play video games sometimes myself, sometimes with my son. I know a lot of people are way more into it than I am. And there'll be the option if something is too difficult, you can skip the fight. I don't want to fight this battle. This looks too hard. doesn't look fun. I'm not going to enjoy it. It's not going to benefit me. It's not worth my time. God didn't give you the option to pick which battle you're going to fight. You don't get to pick your battles. Matthew 10, 8, that we've already read, it says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons if you feel like it, or you had a good day, or you've had your coffee, or you got a good night's sleep. That's not what it says. Heal, raise, cleanse, drive out. Period. They're commandments. We got to remember who we're fighting for here. There is, a, there is an army we signed up for and a commander that gives orders, not suggestions or options. It's a commandment. Go, and when you encounter these things, this is how you behave. This is what you were trained for. Don't hunt these things down. You're not an assassin, but if you run into one between here and where I've sent you, you heal it, you cleanse it, you cast it out. Period. Standing against the evil that we encounter when we're living out the purpose of God is not an option. I'm going to say that again. Standing against the evil that we encounter when we're walking out the purpose of God is not an option. It's a direct order from on high. You don't ignore it. You don't extend it grace. You don't pretend it's the job of some other great saint to get rid of the problem. You heal, you cleanse, and you cast out. Period. But here's the thing where you have to be careful. We're fighting on God's terms, not our own. And so I don't get to make a spectacle out of the battle. You've seen these folks. Well, I'm just fighting this rough one, brother. It's all I can do but the strength of the Lord. And I've had to do this and I've had to do that. And there's been this doctor and there's been that person. And so-and-so said this about me and my mom and my big toe and my flat tire. Oh, my heavens help us. You got people that want the attention from the battles they're fighting like that. Then you've got these other folks that want to throw up a tent and say, I can cast demons out of anything and heal anybody that's sick. Come see me do the great work of the Lord. They're both wrong. If the Lord sent you to do that, by all means. But if you've just encountered something in the course of following the Lord, you don't make a spectacle out of the event and turn it into, look what I can do for Jesus. You've just committed the same sin as the man that went demon hunting. 
You stepped off the path because I encountered this along the way. I do what God said do, and I keep walking because it says those things will follow me. And there may be some people I look around and say they're interested that that happens to me, but my goal is not to entertain them by exercising the power of the Spirit over what gets in my way. My goal is to finish the race and complete the course and have God say, well done, good and faithful servant at the end of the day. I fight the battle. I don't get to pick it. I don't go looking for other ones, but I also don't make a spectacle of the ones that I fight. Spreading the gospel is my purpose. The battles are a side quest. They're a minor inconvenience. They're not the reason I'm here. My goal is to serve the purpose of Christ. And this brings us to the second part of the question of Goliath. In the first part of his question, he challenges the tactics of Israel. And in the second part, he challenges the loyalty of Israel. Am I not a Philistine? And do you not serve Saul? If you don't already see the problem with that question, let me help you. The army of the Lord does not serve Saul. Goliath wants to undermine the true enemy. He wants the person he's standing against to forget that they are fighting for God. These are God's people, not Saul's people. When the enemy comes against you, he's not coming against Pastor Rocket or against Kathy or against Venus or against whoever you are tonight. He's not coming against you or your family. He's coming against the army of the Lord that you stand for and function in. Don't forget who you're fighting for. Goliath wanted to bring Israel's people down to his level. Don't we both serve a king who has a purpose and a goal? Come and serve your king in the way that makes the most sense. Let us fight like equals. And the thing we must realize is that even the lowest ranking officer, even the lowest ranking member who doesn't even have an office or a stripe or anything on his uniform yet in the army of God, the simple fact that he is enlisted means that he is no equal with his enemy. He is absolutely a conqueror and an overcomer over all things that the enemy would throw at him. Do not let the enemy lie to you and convince you that what we're doing is fighting as equals. No such thing exists. For a child of God. We are victorious. We serve a God that is great. We don't serve God's purposes. So that we can then be brought down to the level. Of something less than man. We must never forget. For whom we're fighting. 1 Samuel 17 26. It's further on in this story. David knows what's up. He comes up and he sees Goliath taunting these men. Why would you line up in this way? Don't we both serve a king? Why can't we do things the way I want? And David speaks to the men that are standing with him, and he says, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the army of the living God? David didn't say, who comes to defy Saul? He didn't say who comes to defy my king. He didn't say who comes to defy the general. He didn't even say who comes to defy the army. Who comes to defy the Lord? Because David knows who he fights for and why he's there. The shepherd boy from the field who doesn't even have armor to fight in or weapons to fight with knows who he stands for and says, why is this man taunting God? We're not just men fighting for a king, says David. Who is this man that stands up to the God of the universe? He wasn't confused or fooled by the bluster and the lie of the enemy. See, here's here's an interesting thing. It says Goliath came out and he shouted these questions at them. He shouted these questions at them. He sought to declare himself Famous. That's what that word shouted means. It means he came out and he said, I'm great. Look at how amazing I am. But you want to know something interesting? There's a long list that describes the armor that he wore and how big that he was and how loud that he could yell. But nobody saw him fight. 
He was big and loud and obnoxious and intimidating and sought to change the terms of the battle and sought to undermine who God's people were and tell them they were something less than they were. But at the end of the day, he had done nothing to demonstrate that anything he said was even true. Fear tactics, intimidation is all he had at his disposal. And at the end of the day, your enemy, when he comes against you, has nothing more than the ability to intimidate you or inconvenience you at best. He would love to convince you that that loud, roaring lion that he wants to be will come and devour you. But God has said, I've already won this victory. The worst he can do is annoy you if you keep standing there and letting him shout in your face. David saw through that. He says, who stands up to God? I'm not on par with you. The faith that we have in Christ is the foundation that we fight from. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of the eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. I'm asking you tonight, whose man or woman are you? You don't belong to Saul. You don't belong to any president or any pastor or any other ruler. You're God's. If you've entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are God's man or God's woman. Don't let the enemy tell you you're something less. The enemy wants to fight on the terms of the person that he serves. He serves himself. He serves ambition. He serves pride. He serves envy. He serves greed. He serves authority and power and influence and title and reputation. And too many people in the church have gotten sucked into the idea of fighting on behalf of those things. I get to be the pastor. I get to be in charge of this Bible study. I get to be something that's important in the kingdom of God. No, you don't. You don't need to be anything more important than the lowest ranking member of God's army to do everything God needs you to do. Stop being sucked off of your purpose and off the path and letting the enemy get you into his realm of my authority my power my influence is what will win you will lose no matter how long you've been in the church if you walk in that direction the enemy wants to suck you into what he serves and say you're just like me and when these men and great these great men and women fall like we've seen so many of over the past two or three or four decades who have stood up and been pillars in the community of the of, of christ on the earth we see them fall and the world looks at them and says see They were fighting on someone else's terms. And it's heartbreaking what it's done to the kingdom. But the enemy wins if he can get you to fight on your intellect or your experience. If you can forget who you're serving and why you're serving, he can suck you into serving the same thing he does. Ambition, pride, position, authority. We've got to remember we're not fighting for the same things that he is. We're not fighting for a man. We're not fighting for a king. We're not fighting for any kind of personal earthly gain. We are fighting for faith. In verse 12, it says the fight of that verse we just read, the fight of faith, the unchangeable conviction of the truth of who God is. That word faith is the same one we talked about in the message this morning, and I've talked about it so many times. The faith that Peter had that God says, I'll build a church on this. The one that I taught about this morning, I said, God will establish you as a temple based on your personal faith in who he is. This is what we fight for. We fight for Christ and we fight when he ordains it and no other time and for no other reason. And God only commands that we fight when we encounter opposition on the way to the purpose that he has for us. Establishing the church, proliferating the faith, making his name great and bringing him glory. And just like he told Peter, if we will fight from that position and only on those occasions and on the terms that God has defined, the forces of hell will not overpower us. As I'm coming to a close, I want to ask you this question. In the battles that you're fighting today, on whose terms are you fighting? You stand with me tonight. We're going to pray in just a moment. I'm going to ask that question one more time. In the battle that you're fighting today, on whose terms are you fighting? The question of, the, of Goliath is, who are you fighting for? 
And why are you fighting that way? Do you know the answer to that question? If you're in a fight right now that you sought for yourself, Father, be with me. Let your spirit do his work tonight. If you sought this fight yourself, the Lord wants to talk to you tonight. If you left behind the faith that you once knew because you wanted to seek fortune on your own terms, God wants to speak to you tonight. If you took on a battle because you were taunted and you gave in to the shouting and the intimidation of the enemy and felt you had to rush in right now, the Lord wants to talk to you tonight. He says this, will you drop your sword? Will you repent and let me rescue you? The Lord says this to you tonight. If you're in one of those positions, he says, my son, my daughter, don't continue. Oh, don't continue to fight naked and ashamed. Don't let your own pride force you to finish this to the point that it destroys you. Tonight, the Lord calls to you and he says, will you come back to your faith and let me minister to you? And restore you because all is not lost in this battle. If you find yourself in a fight tonight that is not the one the Lord ordained. He wants you to stop fighting and let him heal you. And bring you home and rescue you from the destruction that you're bound for. To the rest of you tonight the Lord would say this. If you find yourself in a fight that you have encountered that was unavoidable because it was on the path from where you are to where God's called you to be. Tonight the Lord says this, my son, my daughter, I encourage you. Continue to fight from your faith because against you the enemy and the gates of hell will not prevail. There is victory for you in the place that you fight from tonight, says the Lord. Lord is speaking this evening and he wants to call you home from the battle that you're doomed to lose and he wants to encourage you that you will win the battle that he sent you to fight I'm going to close with this last verse and I'm going to pray Philippians 1 27 and 28 says this live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and then whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, working side by side for the faith that comes from the gospel. Do not be alarmed or intimidated by those who oppose you. Your fearless discernment is a clear sign of their pending destruction. And it is proof of your deliverance and salvation tonight by the power of God. Father, I thank you this evening for your word. I thank you for the scriptures that we've read. And I thank you for the perspective that we have on warfare. I thank you for you showing us tonight through this question, the questions of Goliath, the way the enemy would seek to taunt us. I thank you for pointing us in the direction of victory. I thank you for correcting our course. I thank you for calling home those that have wandered off to fight the wrong battle. And I thank you for encouraging those who are fighting a battle that is absolutely being fought on your terms from your ground where the victory is secure. I pray that you'll be with us tonight as we leave this place so that we'll remember these words. And, Father, we will be safe and secure in you, whether it's because we've returned to you or because we're pressing on in the fight that you've encouraged us to continue. Father, we love you. We're grateful for all that you've done for us. I pray, Lord, that you'll keep us safe as you continue to grow us and draw us nearer to you. And I pray that you'll bring us back here soon at your time to hear your word again. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this evening. I look forward to seeing you again very soon.